Welcome to A Professor's Life, your weekly insight into the Ivory Tower. I'm Chris. With me, as always, is Robert. Hello. And Stephen. Hey there, folks. All right. Today's topic is going to be, should I consider a job in academia? So, um, <laughs> you know, that's kind it's of a... Uh, thank you for a good show. Yeah, yes. that's <clears throat> tough. Yeah, the answer is no, no. That's a tough question because there's a lot of personal um, sort of issues that would go along with this question. And obviously, uh, listener, we don't know you personally. Uh, <laughs> and so ultimately, this is a question that you have to answer for yourself. But what we're going to do on the show is talk a little bit about um, sort of what is it like to chase down this kind of job? What is involved with, you know, uh, getting trained for it, what's involved for, you know, different types of professorship positions, and what are the steps that you have to take in order to land the job and then keep the job? Right. And ultimately, is all of that effort worth it to you? Right. All right. Uh, I guess I'll preempt this with saying every job has BS. <laughs> all right. We'll keep the clean tag on, so we'll say BS. Ultimately, the question you want to ask yourself is, what set of BS do you want to put up with? And what set of BS do you not want to put up with? Mm -hmm. And I think what we'll try to do today is tell you what's the BS associated with being a professor. And then you can decide for yourself whether you want to do that. Seems fair to me. Yeah. So, um, let's see. How should we get started? Let's talk a little bit about... Um, maybe what this show is, appro who this show is kind of appropriate for before we get into the nitty gritty. Uh, and I was doing some thinking about this before, and I think there's like a couple different groups of people. There's sort of the, the bright eyed sort of undergraduate who says, I want to be a professor one day, <laughs> right? Uh, we all have those in our classes, <laughs> right? And uh, then there is sort of the grad student who's thinking, what do I do after grad school? I know, I'll become a professor. Right. Um, and then there's sort of the group of people you might not think too much about when you're asking this question. Like the mid-career faculty who is asking themselves, I'm approaching middle age. Do I want to spend the second half of my life doing this? Mm. Um, and then, of course, there's a the late career faculty member who says, hey, I've done it. What kind of advice do I give to the, the bright-eyed student yep. who is looking to become a professor? They come to me and say, hey, I want to be a professor. What do I have to do? So uh, let's start sharing some thoughts about this. Uh, let's start with Stephen. So what are your thoughts about sort of, you know, who is this, what, who is this show appropriate for and uh, move from for now? Well, I guess when I, when I thought of this question, uh, you, you know, you posed this one, Chris, via email, and I thought this was a good idea. Um, I came from that first point, the you're an undergrad and do I want to go down to this whole grad school thing? And that's, I guess, what, what stuck in my mind when I thought through this. Now, I'll tell you my background. I, I was a psychology major undergrad, which meant, you know, I, I have to go to grad school. You know, it's it's everybody goes into this path uh, to become a, um, uh, goes to grad school if you have a psychology degree or you aren't getting a job. I mean, you, you aren't trained to have a specific skill set necessarily without doing this. So this was always on my mind. I always expected to go to grad school. I always thought about it. And so, you know, the, the whole setup and I think the pathing that you have as a student is different. Uh, you start taking classes early on, prepping yourself for grad school. You take these kinds of classes, you know they want those there. Um, you recognize the classes you're going to have to do uh, to have the knowledge base to take for the, the graduate school exams, whatever those might be, GREs, GMATs, whatever. Um, so, so that was always on my mind. Now, I ended up in a different area than psychology um, by chance in some respects, but that, that, that was the culture that I, was, I went through. So speaking to that population, now having been on the other side of saying, hey, you know, I went to grad school and not only did I go to grad school, I became a professor. I didn't just take that and go applied, which is actually what you would find from the vast majority of the psych people who do make the transition, uh, you know, because I was looking at clinical psychology. So it really was a statement of becoming a psychiatrist. Uh, most of those people are working in actual practice. So um, that, that's, that's how I would frame a lot of what I would be talking about here that I would want to bring into this conversation today. Sure, sure. How about you, Robert? What are your thoughts of sort of how, what, who is this, the tar who's the target audience for this kind of discussion? Uh, well, at least in, in my field, 
it could actually be uh, a different group even from there. It's, it could be the mid-career professional who's decided, hey, I think I now want to bail from the corporate world and go into academia. Um, at least uh, among business school professors, this is not completely uncommon. In fact, many of them have, depending on the school, may even be required that you have a certain level of, of corporate experience mm -hmm. before you go back. Some require that you have the MBA before you go to get the PhD. Uh, some don't. My current department, there's two of us that have MBAs, and there's like 15 that don't. Hmm. Um, but in uh, my previous department, it was the very rare exception, the person who didn't have an MBA. So you, you get this uh, slightly different split. So I think this um, not only applies to the, the, the new grad student, the mid-career academia, do they want to stay in, but even to the, you know, you're a 30 or 40 something, mm -hmm. you know, do you want to make a complete career switch, give up four to six years uh, doing the PhD uh, so that you can then become an academic? So, so give you a sense, we're, we're going to bring in three to four PhD students next year, and I'm the head of our recruiting committee for this. Um, our short list right now includes a 24-year-old, a 26-year-old, a 40-year-old, a 46-year-old, and I'm trying to think of, I think the other two are in mid to late 20s. Um, so you can see a wide range there. For whatever reason, you know, we're not talking mid-30s at this point, but that's, that's a pretty common range uh, of people, which is very different than I think what uh, most of the sort of hard sciences, particularly, you go directly through. I mean, you can speak oh, better yeah. than that. Yeah, you might, you might do it. Like, I, I did a year teaching high school, um, and I had a couple of friends who did a year doing something as a sort of an in-between year. But, yeah, in general, it's, it doesn't pay to, 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 to not do that. You want to get in, get out as quickly as possible. Yeah. Um, well, sure. they say what field medal winner for math is you have it's best under 40, right? I mean, it's it's a young man's game. Uh, yeah, uh, I do believe um, the field medal is is restricted to under 40. I, yeah, I think that's true. I'm not mathematics, right? Right, I'm not right. 100% certain about that. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it is a young person's game in, in, in many ways. If you're if you're if you're doing sort of um, research at that level, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yeah, when I posted this question, I was actually kind of thinking a little bit more selfishly. I was actually thinking of the mid-career faculty member deciding whether or not to stay. Because uh, it's something that I've, I've personally been thinking about, actually, for about the last year or so. I don't know how much of this is sort of midlife crisis or how much of it is uh, uh, fear of boredom uh, or how much of it is just, you know, grass is always greener. Uh, there's a lot of things here, but I've definitely been thinking about sort of, I've got 25 more years left to work. Uh, is this what I want to keep doing? Um, especially since, you know, I've, I reached full last year and there's really no more carrots. There's only sticks in terms <laughs> of moving up the ranks and, and things like that. So, yeah, um, I think what's great about this kind of topic uh, uh, is that, you know, we've hit the nail on the head. We've, it's, it's good for the, the young folks who are thinking about getting in. It's good for the people who are thinking about a career change into academia. And it's also good to think about, you know, again, what's your priorities for uh, maybe mid-career faculty uh, who are thinking about getting out Perfect. or trying something else. All right. So um, let's see. I guess maybe next we should tackle the myths versus reality. I think Stephen, you put this up yeah. in our, um, our show notes. Do you want to start maybe a little bit, uh, what you're thinking there? Yeah. So when I, when I think about this, I, I remember talking to naive doctoral students, brand new into the program, uh, or even when you're talking to applicants and the question is, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to be an academic when you grow up? Uh, and so many of them talk about, you know, it's such a great job. It's just so flexible. You know, you only work for a couple days of the week. You only work for a couple months out of the year, what? you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, talk to your parents. Any any parents of academics still believe that that's what the job is. Um, and so that that is the myth. It is this myth that it's just this easy lifestyle that you just don't have to work that hard and it's all flexible. Um which, of course, as we all know, that is not the reality. I mean, that's part of what our show was last week was, you know, how do we even fit things into the to the day? Those who have actually got into this, and I think it was, again, it was a great question last week, um, you know, you, you don't have enough time. Uh, you, you It boils into your nights. It boils into your weekends. And so how do you actually, you know, 
uh, pare that down and, and, and try to constrain your life. So I, I think that's that's one of the big things you have to start with is the idea that don't choose this career because, man, this is just an easy job. I mean, there was probably a point in time when this was an easy job, um, but expectations have just just up ramp, uh, uh, getting higher, getting getting bigger. Uh, you know, to get a job in my field, you have to have multiple top tier publications out of grad school. Uh, that that's the norm now, and so then you have to hold that. So you have to keep up on this, and then you have to do more, and then you have to you know you expand your responsibilities, and you expand and you expand and you expand. And so it isn't a spot where I could sit around all week just playing video games. I, I can't do that and, and maintain my job in any sort of meaningful way. I'm never going to get a raise, particularly now. I mean, I'm a full professor, so I can get away with more than I probably could have, you know, 10 years ago. But you, you, it's not a game of, of doing nothing. And those who are saying, okay, well, I didn't really, I don't really want to do research. I just want to teach. That's still not a cakewalk. Yeah. It's not like those statements. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not one of those spots that you just, oh, I have so much free time now, you know. I, I would argue that you may even have less. I mean, the teaching expectations of the pure teaching schools mm -hmm. gotten outrageous. Yeah, four, four, five, five. Yeah, I've done the four, four gig, and it's it's rough. Uh, I'm on a three, three now, which is a lot better. It gives me more time to do my research, but it's still, uh, you know. To clarify, for those who don't know what that means, four, four, or three, three means uh, how many courses you teach per semester. So that'd be four, three course, uh, three credit courses. So that's twelve credits uh, per semester. Uh, that is not a light load in any way. Yeah, I'm on three, four credit courses. Oh wow. Um, okay. And actually, the way it works with labs is I'm on two lectures, two labs. Okay. And so uh, it has its advantages and disadvantages, and that's maybe for a different show. But yeah, you're right. I mean, you're either you're either teaching, you're preparing to teach, right. or you're working with students. Right. Right. You're grading. Um, like, you're yeah. you're uh, you're getting through all the, the stuff that goes around that. That is that's mentoring. That's career work. That's advising. yeah. Advising. Yeah. yeah. Advising. Yeah. All of that stuff. And so I mean, as we it's talked about last week, we can scratch out time for research, and I've been able to do that in my career. But it's not. Oh, I'm gonna you know not work on Thursdays. Because right. even if I design my schedule so I don't have classes on Thursdays, right. I'm still working on Thursdays. It's right. a normal work day. Else then. Yeah, right. I may be working on research for part of that day, or I might be cleaning up committee documents, or, or whatever the case might be that Thursday. So, yeah, it's even I, – I know of people who say, oh, the teaching, you know, that's sort of like the easy way out in the academic world. I'm like, no. No. Come, come follow me for a day, or, or actually better yet, follow me for a week. Well, and things get more – get much more complicated too when you think about the mixture here. So being a teacher at a teaching school is a very different job than being exclusively a teacher at a research school. Being exclusively a teacher at a research school has its own extra costs because now you're going to be devalued compared to most of the other faculty. Oh, um, yeah. And on top of that, you're expected to take on additional responsibilities that the, uh, the research faculty don't necessarily want to do. So, you know, the, the advising goes almost entirely onto that. The mentoring perhaps goes all on to the people who are teachers on, on our research faculty. Um, it, it, there is no place that it's just coast along. Uh, or if you do have that spot of, hey, look, I only have two courses, you know, a semester because I'm just an adjunct, you know. I don't think anybody's being like, yay, I'm an adjunct. You know, you talk to anybody who's an adjunct professor, they're like, I really don't want to be this. My job is, you know, at will at this point, and I don't know if I'm going to be in this state anymore. And if you're you're working at a university, if you're the only university in town and the next university is an hour away, if you don't get this job in this spot, you have to move, you know, or you're commuting two hours a day. I mean, that's not a fun time either. Yeah, you should just make the assumption. I've seen who are super happy or uh, people that are retired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they just want to interact with the kids. Right. Yeah. If you're thinking about moving into academia, you should make the assumption that you will not be living where you want to live. <laughs> you have very little to no control over that. Right. You'll be living to where, wherever the job is. Right. Which is an adventure. If you want to take it from that perspective, yeah. there are great opportunities to take jobs all throughout the world right now. Yep. And if I want to pick up and move to Singapore, I can move to Singapore tomorrow and have a great job. But I don't want to. But that's not that's not about Singapore. That's just my family doesn't want to get a pickup and move. But if I want a job in you know certain places, good luck on that. I mean, if they're not hiring at that school that year, you know, do I not work for a year? That's not really a good path. Right. right. Now, when I um, started looking for my first job, I made a promise to my wife that we would stay east of the Mississippi, hmm. and that was a risk. That was the gamble because it. 
you could have very easily had no job opportunities open to me east of the Mississippi. Yep. Yeah. You know, because it's it's a tough market. Even back in 2004, it was a tough market, and uh, it turned out to work out okay. But even restricting myself to east of the Mississippi could have ended differently. So, uh, let's see. You definitely got to do the next one. <laughs> yeah, the job paths. Yeah. Yeah, and I think actually, um, maybe before we do that, why don't we talk about the steps to becoming a professor, and then we can tweak for the different uh, types. Okay. Yeah. So. Oh, school types. I was okay. Uh, we're we're thinking totally different things. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'm thinking, how do you pick which grad school to go to? Oh, okay. I was thinking of what type of school you want to work at, but yeah, go right ahead. Then let's talk about that. Um, because at least in in my field, it's lateral and down with very rare exceptions. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to be at a top 20 school, you pretty much got to go to a top 20 school. There's these little interconnected networks of we hire your students, you hire mm -hmm. our students. Um, it's very clicky. So if, if you want to be at an elite research school, you need to go to an elite research school. Um, if you want to be in an Ivy, you pretty much got to go to an Ivy. Mm -hmm. Uh, because there's some people work their way up, you know. Um, I mean, and I'm not talking you got underplaced after you came out of school. I'm talking have moved up institutional prestige. But generally, it's lateral or down. So that that can be a, a, a very serious consideration when you're thinking about going to grad school. But the the concession that has to be part of that is you know picking where you want to be or what kind of school you want to be, you have to really understand what that even means. Um, you know, again, following the, the idea of what is it like to be in a business field um, or the business, whatever, domain, having a job at a top 25 MBA program school is not the same as having a job at a top 25 research program. But from the outside, people don't necessarily understand that. Right. And so you have to, you have to understand that question before you even applied to the right programs or, or while you're choosing which program you're going to. Uh, the, the applications look different. The, um, the criteria that people are, at, are looking for on the, the interviews look very different. So you have to have an understanding of that in yourself and people who, who waffle. I mean, we had a guy who applied this year who looks pretty good on paper, but basically said is, I might want to go into teaching. I might want to be a researcher. I might want to go consulting. I'm just really not sure I'm open to anything. <laughs> I'm open again. You find a frame it as I'm open to anything, and the statement is we do this one thing at our, our institution. It's what we train you to do. If you want a job in th that looks just like this, we can help you with that. If you want a job that looks anything else, go elsewhere because they are a better spot. At you know, fifty institutions are better than we are at that. Yeah, and I didn't know what I was doing. I'll be the first to admit, seriously, <laughs> I was just applying to grad schools. Yep. I wasn't thinking lateral or down or the yep. any. And I would say, you know, lateral or down is probably a fair assessment across the board. Uh, mm -hmm. And in my experience and people I've talked to, I could be wrong about that. But uh, even in things I've seen in physics, uh, you know, lateral or down, I think is probably pretty appropriate. Well, it depends so much on across most fields. Yeah, it yeah. depends on, on the resources. Yeah, because you think of science guys, you know, if you need a lab, you're not going to get that at a school that doesn't have one. Right. Um, or if you need, uh, and it's, one, I think it is we're snobs uh, in the way we look at who we hire and use the school as a proxy of quality. And two, it's just the networking effect. It's these are the people that know, and that's how you get jobs because someone made a call. Right. So, yeah, your letters, it's just like, oh, I know them. You know, when faculty write letters for you that first gig. Yeah. So after that, then you can live or die on your own work. Mm -hmm. But that first one, no, you don't have any work. Right. But yeah. getting that first job may make a big difference because you may not have the resources to be able to get the publications that can get you the next job, unless you're really a hustler. Yeah. Now, of course, if you're at a teaching focus school, the game's a little different. Right. So when we're reviewing applications, so I'm looking for, does this person have teaching experience? And is it real teaching experience, or do they babysit labs for a couple semesters right. during grad school, right? And uh, when somebody comes to me and says, you know, for example, oh, I really, really want to teach. I, I got a PhD because I want to teach, and all I see are a series of postdocs, research postdocs, and there's absolutely no desire or right. effort made to teach anything other than the labs they babysit as a TA in grad school. 
you know, that's that's a different kind of thing. Uh, I don't necessarily care so much who their letters of recommendation are from. I mean, that is to say, I want them to be from PhDs, you know, people who have a supervisory <laughs> role, right? But I don't care if that person is sort of the expert in their, you know, the standard expert in their field, the internationally known so-and-so of whatever. Um, I'm much more interested, you know, in different things. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a lower standard. It just means it's a different standard, you know, because the job is different. Therefore, we're looking for different things. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, your school type, if you're thinking of becoming a professor, you really want to think, you know, what kind of school do I want to teach at? And then you want to enter the grad school that's sort of it's comparable you know, to that, I think, I think lateral or down might actually be the, uh, show title. <laughs> oh, maybe not. I don't know. It's a, but it's anyway. stealing a little bit from eastbound and down, but we'll ignore that point at the moment. Oh yeah. Well, that's true. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the steps to becoming a professor. Since we're talking about, you know, um, should you consider a job in academia before you consider this job in academia, you should probably know what you're getting yourself <laughs> into. Now we talked a little bit about the myth versus reality. And there is this standard um, sort of sequence, if you will, but there are a lot of pitfalls in the way, along the way. Mm -hmm. And the standard sequence that most people think of is, you know, undergrad, graduate school, postdoc for some fields, not all fields, right? Then your assistant professor position, then you get tenure, your associate professor, then you get full, and then it's, you know, life is happily ever after. That's sort of the, the story, right? Um, and all seven people that that happened to, you know, tip, tip a hat to them great for them you know because the reality of the situation is that um you're looking at a lot of years of your life mm -hmm. to get to that secure position of full professor and you're get, looking at a lot of years prime years of your life think about you know when you go to graduate school uh for many people it's right after undergraduate school and so you're going to spend six or more years of your 20s in school making 20k a year maybe while well, your friends who graduated high school with you are buying their first house <laughs> right and those kids maybe this friends maybe never even went to college uh and then you end up as a postdoc and maybe uh i i i was fortunate i avoided that but uh but if they say you do the postdoc thing and you might be there two years you might be there 10 years you might have multiple postdocs yeah you may yep. never leave postdoc <laughs> Yeah. And I know quite a few people that are physicists who never did. Uh, yeah. It's not an unusual fate. And then, you know, you go to postdoc and you might say, hey, you know what? I'm going to take this adjunct position to uh, get some experience teaching. And then all of a sudden, you know, you can't land that assistant because of a professor job. Right. And so there's these pitfalls that happen along the way that are, that are tough. Um, it's not... A lot of people think of becoming a professor is like you do this then you do this then you do this then you do this right and that's just simply not how it works i mean in principle that's how it should work right well think of the number of people that don't even get the phd right right i mean right. it's a huge number of people that end up never getting their dissertation finished mm -hmm. and just bail and it's just like well, what did you do with the last seven years of your life before they kicked you out right i mean why did you do that to yourself mm -hmm. Uh, and it's just so sad when you see it. Well, again, that comes from not really understanding what this career is. And after being in it for three, four, five years of grad school, you start to wake up saying, do I love this? Do I love what I'm doing? Do I love my pathing? Have I ever seen my advisor in the last five years? Because um, some people could talk about ha having not seen their advisor in several years. Um, you know, or, you know, Robert, you could talk about how, you know, I'm on my 11th prep in grad school. Uh, for teaching is was that really worth me doing um, so some people are in that space and you know I remember in grad school there was a person in poli sci who I think was in his ninth year of, of his PhD he decided at that point to, to unionize the grad students um, generally if you're that far into it and you're not you're, you're basically giving up on getting a job I guess that's why you want to unionize but you know you've chosen that you're never going to finish in that path so that that is a, a not in some, that is not a small hurdle to get past. You're actually defending your dissertation and getting a degree is a really meaningful step, but it's not the end of the road in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, because up till comps, it's pretty much undergrad part two. 
Mm -hmm. But as soon as you hit comps and you're on your own, there are some people that just, it doesn't suit them. Uh, and it's just sad. But again, you know, like Chris said, at every, any one of these stages can kill you. And then two of the three of us, because I'm in the same boat as you, Chris, I'm topped out now and I was thinking, should I jump back to corporate? <laughs> Uh, so even though when you finish, you know, you've made it to the end and you start thinking of, well, is there, no, are there no more mountains to climb now? Maybe I should find myself a new mountain. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. It's either that good administration, right? Well, yeah, but even though I've done that also, right. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, okay, president of a university, that sounds lame. You know, Government. You get to <laughs> where there's, you kind of look at, well, maybe I want to try something else. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it, it's, I don't think it ever ends for anybody, and you can be derailed so easy at any step. Yeah. Even if it all goes smoothly. Mm -hmm. Well, then it becomes tough because you're like, oh my gosh, let's talk, let's talk about the years in to mm -hmm. get to a full professor. All yeah. right. I know some people are like, why well, talk about full when I'm trying to land my first assistant gig? Let's take just the big view of it for a moment. Mm -hmm. You get done, you, let's say you get done high school, you do four years as an undergraduate, mm -hmm. you do, let's just be conservative and say six as a graduate student. There are some fields where it's longer, there's some fields where it's shorter. I did five, mm -hmm. uh, but I knew people who did eight or nine. So yeah. we're talking now 10 years after high school. Yeah. And now you're going to try to find a postdoc position that will pay, let's say in the sciences, 40 some thousand dollars, okay. maybe 50. All right, I think that might be the going rate. I'm a little out of it. It could be a little low, but... Uh, so, I mean, there's probably a, a percentage of faculty pay is roughly what it is, and it's probably in the range of, like, 60% of what a faculty at that university is making. Right, right. So you are now 12 years... So the end of your first postdoc, you're now 12 years after high school, right? Your undergraduate friends have... Uh, eight years on you in their career. Mm -hmm. And you're not yet gainfully employed in your actual career. Right. And you are probably doing another postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> That's the probability, right? Yeah. And, and so this is not to be disparaging of the profession. I think it's just to be honest is, mm -hmm. is really what I'm trying to get at. And let's say you, you, you just do one postdoc. Now you have six years as an assistant professor where you are working your butt off to try to secure tenure, keys to the castle. Well, to be clear, too, that's the first window, yeah. right? So there are a lot of people who actually reset their clock by moving to another university. So maybe they do yes. four years and then move and reset. So maybe it's 10 years sure. to the tenure decision. Right. So I'm trying to, I'm talking yeah. like shortest path. Okay. I'm trying to be, you know, so, so here we have, <laughs> let's just say like six years grad, uh, grad school, let's say two years postdocs is eight years. Now six years as an assistant, there's 14 years in. Yeah. All right. Not counting the four years of undergraduate. Let's just, you know, put that to the side for a moment. Now you've, you've got tenure. Now you're, you're, you're secure. But you have one hell of a hill to climb for 14 years. And then, you know, if you want to chase down full, it's not like, you know, tenure and you're done because mm -hmm. there's post-tenure review, mm -hmm. right? And, and you do have things you have to do. And so it's, uh, it's a bit of a slog. It's something, I think, Stephen, you put it correctly. You absolutely have to love what it is that you are doing. Mm -hmm. If you do not love it, it's going to eat you alive. Yes, yeah, so you could be, what, 20 years out when you finally get full yep. out of high school. And then at certain schools, you then have the next rung of the fellowship professorship chair. Yep. <laughs> but that's usually optional. 25, yeah. 30 years in before you top out. Yeah. But, oh, that, that's actually not a bad thing. I mean, if you, you take, take a corporate job... You take a corporate job, do you top out at what? I mean, CEO, I guess, but that's you're not topping out at CEO until you're in, again, best case scenario in your 40s. Um, well, let's do the 20 years, though. Yeah. Most people have hit CEO 20 years. Yeah. You're probably fully vested in a law firm. Your doctor that's yeah. pulling down 400. Uh, if you're thinking this is the way to, to go because you want to make money or prestige or have time, 
you're just wrong. This yeah. is like, I must be a sculptor or I will die. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to do it because you want to be an academic. Mm -hmm. And Stop all along, sitting around with, you know, patches on our sleeves. Right, right. No, and all along, you're putting off major life decisions in many cases. Oh, yeah. Right? Because oh, yeah. it is, uh, you know, it's tough to say, hey, you know what? And let's say you're single as you get out of undergraduate. Dating is tough as a grad student. Yep. You might think it's, you know, oh, well, there's all these people here with my same interests. <laughs> yeah, but you're really busy. Um, <laughs> and if you do, if you end up, because I'm dual career, mm -hmm. yeah, that sucks. Mm -hmm. So you have stuff. someone who can understand what you're talking about and get into it because they're also an academic. Try to find two effing jobs at the mm -hmm. same place. But well, it, it's a broader statement. I mean, you're, you're saying two jobs at the same university is a real problem. True. But if you're stuck also saying, you know, I've got the perfect academic job in a town of 15,000 people where, you know, for example, the town that I live in, the number one employer is a university. Number two is healthcare. Number three is Walmart. If your, your significant other wants to work at not one of those three locations, they're in trouble. Right? Yeah. I mean, if you haven't found somebody, what, it's 20 somethings and townies? Yeah. I mean, it's, That's why people, you end up see, hearing all these really salacious stories of faculty, you know, dating grad students because there's nothing else available. Now, again, I'm not saying, I'm not advocating for that. There's power issues there and ethical issues that are bad. But it is also, you know, who else can you run into? Who else is there? Well, and on top of that, you know, if you talk about with children, you know, for very legitimate reasons, people put off until after tenure, mm -hmm. you know, for very legitimate reasons. And so you're, you're, you're looking now at being, let's say, you 35, know, 40, 35, 40, mm -hmm. and thinking about, you know, having an infant, whereas right. your friends, um, they've had that, that Their first kids kid graduating college. Yeah. Well, or high school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or college. Yeah. You're, you're talking to them saying, don't become a grad student. Don't no, mm -hmm. but it's also, I mean, there, this is, this is one of the things that I, I've, I've, um, fortunate enough to learn quite a bit about my sister actually runs a uh, women's center uh, at a university and she works exclusively for basically with women uh, at, at at this major university and this is the decision they're all being told I mean all the faculty are telling female um, assistant professors you know you really shouldn't have a child right now I mean th first off that there's a that's a really unethical thing to be at, telling somebody don't have children. Okay, that no, you can't tell somebody not to do that. Secondly, from a career perspective, you know, who are you to do this? Um, but then the, the facts that start going along with that is that women are, are at, at a uh, pretty comparable level in terms of getting PhDs to men, but are at a much, a, a massive disadvantage in terms of getting tenure to men uh, at, at age. Um, and some of that is, you know, again, I'm, if you choose to have a child, some universities are better about this. They'll give actual uh, maternity leave. They'll add that to your clock. That's a good thing. Uh, I had a, a friend who basically had to sue the entire University of California system uh, over tenure because they would not count her maternity leave uh, as extending her clock. And uh, she, after going through two rounds, she finally got tenure. But that was after getting denied twice. You know, and that, that's not a small thing. I mean, that's not a, something that you want to put your family through. And as an individual, that, that's not good for your ego that you said, I think I'm good enough, but your system is penalizing me because I wanted to have children. You know, that, that, that's not a, you don't do that just haphazardly. You have to make a real decision. Again, going back to the earlier quote is you want to do this because you love it. So why don't we bring it around <laughs> to the end? And uh, so, Chris, your idea, was it worth it? <laughs> yeah, so here's the thing, you know, um, what are the rewards for this job? So as Robert pointed out, you ain't getting rich doing this. All right. Uh, especially, uh, I mean, I don't know what pay scales are across the country, but I can tell you, if you're at a teaching focused institution, you know, you get your first tenure track job, uh, 50s, might be where you're starting, middle 40s, depending, I don't know. Uh, and... I can tell you from experience that my first to tenure track job was in the low 40s. And uh, so, yeah, you ain't getting rich doing this. And you have to do it because you absolutely love what you're doing. The rewards are not tangible often. The rewards are, you know, you want to contribute to your field. You want to train people to be 
the next physicist or the next entrepreneur or the next you know <laughs> businessman whatever it may be you you are in a service profession and we get to shape and transform lives yes yes and it can be a very rewarding a very excellent thing to do mm -hmm. but you need to know coming in that's the reward yeah if you're looking I mean, yes because the money's okay but yeah. uh even business law medicine tend to pay the most mm -hmm. but again if you were to go outside academia five times ten times as much um yeah so it's it's because you want to transform lives and make a difference um impact your field grow the knowledge base you know it's all these intangible things yep yeah absolutely and and, and what will happen to you is you'll graduate your, you know, your students will graduate and and they'll tell you oh guess what i got this job doing this and <laughs> and you realize holy crap they're making like you know more 30 percent more than i'm making right now and i'm a full <laughs> professor <Yeah. laughs> and so yeah and so it's it just it can't be money that drives you into this profession um because it will be the money that drives you out if that's what tries to drive you in mm -hmm. yeah that's true yeah so was it worth it uh so far so good um <laughs> i i like what i do i actually i should think about i love what i do uh, so the question is, do I want to keep doing it, like, in for the second half of my life? Mm -hmm. I think so. But uh, I think it definitely. Rec I think, I th and I, like I said, and I think this is true no matter what profession you're in. Yeah, you have to sometimes take a step back and just say, do I want to keep walking down this path? Mm -hmm. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Everybody has that mid career. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. what about for you guys, Robert? I'm in the same boat with Chris. Yeah, most of the time it's just like, oh, hell yeah. And sometimes it's just like, oh, I don't know. Kind of depends on how much student bitching or <laughs> administrator bitching I've dealt with lately. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it comes, it's like any job. It's a job. Yeah. Um, I, I agree to most of us it's also a calling, mm -hmm. but uh, but it's still, it's a job. So you had to put up with the same as the you know, BS <laughs> as, as any other damn job. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I made this switch, oh, so many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> How about for you, Stephen? Uh, no, I, I've been very happy. Um, it's been a fun adventure. Uh, I, I am in the same boat you guys are, which is saying, what's the next 30 years of my life? Because I'm planning out that next 30 years. And he always said to say, well, if I tried this, if I did this other thing... Um, I think I'd be very reticent to walk away from this. I don't know what it would take for me to say I'm not going to be an academic anymore, but I could still see myself saying, let's fold in this other thing. Let's try this new thing. You know, I'd love a new adventure. Let's start a new business. You know, that kind of a thing might be fun to do. But for now, my understanding of academia is I, I love this and I want to be in this space. Um, it's an interesting time to be here too. You know, you, you, there, there's these interesting transitions that we've had. You know, there was the growth, you know, think of post-World War II where the GI Bill allowed a lot of people to go into universities, which meant they had to hire a lot more people. They all grew. Uh, there was a whole thing in the 70s and the 80s is, again, we had some sort of different money that was going around. Um, there was a growth in, in our field. The business school took off in the 80s and they just got massive. Uh, but we're in this space now. We're also seeing how there's technological innovations and going to change what this is. And so my job today and any of our jobs today is not going to be the same job we have in 20 years. Yeah, and, and it may be faster. It may be five years that we have to reevaluate and we're having this professor's life and we're all sitting in VR goggles and we're saying, well, you know, back when I was a grad student, we actually had to talk to people face to face. <laughs> um, you know, so, so I, the one side of me is saying, I'm really excited to see what this future looks like. The risk averse side of me is saying, wait a second, um, you know, is my job and my institution going to exist in the form that it currently is? And should I be thinking about the next phase of my life where there's a transition? Uh, so those who are thinking about going into grad school or going into academic jobs right now need to go eyes wide open. You know, there's going to be a place for research and there's going to be a place for teaching for a long time, but the form of it may change dramatically over the next 20 years. Yeah, and I guess that's what worries me. Um, <laughs> is my job going to be around? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not that I think my school is going to close up shop, right. but is is what I 
it, it's what I like about what I do now going to continue or not. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's ultimately the question. I don't know if we helped any of you uh, <laughs> listeners uh, as we've talked. It's, it sure is helping therapeutic for me. There you go. But, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you like what you've heard uh, or you want to continue the conversation, please tweet us at a prof's life, P R O F S life, a prof's life. Um, you can also email us at a professor's life at gmail.com. Uh, and please be sure to click subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes as that helps us out very much. You can click subscribe to Jester Cat on uh, YouTube and, and see this show and several other shows that we produce. And uh, please, like I said, we'd love to hear comments and suggestions for show topics. So until next time, everybody, let's get back to writing. <laughs>